Welcome to this year's Gender Equality Index Conference. Coming to you live from Brussels, Vilnius, and offices around Europe. Today, we will get the updated scores for gender equality in the EU. Has gender equality gone forward or taken a step backwards? Which country will win the award for most improved? What's driving progress and what's holding us back? Get ready. We are moments away from revealing the result. Welcome to today's conference on the Gender Equality Index 2020 by the European Institute for Gender Equality. My name is Olaf Bruns and it will be my honor and pleasure to lead you through today's presentations and debates. Now, to give you just a quick overview already, we'll kick off with two short opening speeches. We then have a presentation of the main findings of this year's Gender Equality Index and from there, we delve straight into the analysis of those results during a high-level debate with a few very distinguished guests. And in the second part of today's event, we'll have two breakout sessions on topics linked to gender equality and the digital world. The digital world, which has, of course, become much more important in the wake of the COVID-19 crisis, but which is not neutral when it comes to gender equality. Well, and speaking of that digital world, we are online too, there's so many things recently, which gives me all the more reason to invite you. If you're on Twitter, use the hashtag IGEindex, that is E-I-G-E index, hashtag IGEindex, to comment on today's debate, but also to get the message out. But there's more on the technical details in the box, to the right side of your screen, you have the agenda where you can scroll all through today's events, but at the bottom, you can flip between the agenda and the wall. On this wall, you'll get the latest updates and tweets. Switching back to the agenda scroll, the, to the agenda side, if you scroll down to the debate we're going to have later, you can also access the Q&A section where you can type your questions to the panelists. And it's there too, later in the second part of the debate, that you'll be able to choose between the two breakout sessions. But okay, let's get the ball rolling with the opening speeches. First of which is Karlin Schiele, the director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. Karlin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olaf. For the first time, we found ourselves presenting the results of the Gender Equality Index in a completely virtual setup, with hundreds of people joining us online from all over Europe and beyond. I am so glad that despite these challenging times, we're still able to bring you this important gender equality update today. The COVID-19 pandemic has turned life upside down for all of us but it has been harder for some than for others. Healthcare workers, lone parents, older people, migrant workers, delivery drivers, artists, tour operators and students have all experienced the fallout from the pandemic in different ways. The pandemic has brought some serious gender equality challenges to the spotlight. The importance of care work, whether paid or unpaid, and its unequal distribution between women and men is one of them. This needs to be put at the center of COVID-19 response strategies. Only time will show the full effect of the pandemic on gender equality, but we have already seen some gravely concerning situations, such as rising rates of domestic violence as people were confined to their homes. We also know from the previous editions of the Gender Equality Index that progress on gender equality in the EU is far too slow and mostly driven by just a few countries. 
Now, there is a real risk that the COVID-19 pandemic could slow down progress on gender equality even further and potentially send us backwards. Another matter of concern is the gender equality backlash and so-called anti-gender campaigns that we have been seeing in some parts of Europe. In a number of member states, the rise of anti-gender movements has been connected to attempts to reduce the importance of civil society and women's rights organizations through the use of smear campaigns and restrictive legislative measures. In this climate, it is crucial that we stick together and to our values more than ever before. IGA's recent findings from the 25-year review of the Beijing Platform for Action tells us what happened in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis. Policies that were developed in attempts to stem the negative effects of the crisis had a serious impact on gender equality. Austerity fell particularly heavily on women, who tend to be poorer and rely more on public services, including childcare. We need to learn from this, these mistakes and not repeat history. This time, we must ensure that gender equality is put at the center of recovery measures. The gender perspective needs to be mainstreamed into recovery plans. This is the value of gender budgeting, which equates to good governance, if implemented correctly. This approach can help ensure that gender inequalities are not further exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. How can ICAS Gender Equality Index support this process? Gender statistics are crucial to understand the effects of the pandemic on women and men in the various policy areas. Our index will play a crucial role in monitoring these consequences over the short and long term. While this year's index does not yet capture the effects of the ongoing pandemic, we will be watching this space very closely in the years to come. Next year, our index will take an in-depth look at health and gender equality, and in particular, the different health impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on women and men. The strength of IGES index is that it assesses gender equality progress across our society and over time. This tool will give policymakers crucial data and evidence to ensure that COVID-19 recovery measures do not worsen inequalities between women and men. Instead, we should use recovery measures to strengthen gender equality. I am very proud about IGES gender equality index and the solid data it provides. It is increasingly used by policymakers at EU and national levels and was recently acknowledged as a reliable measurement tool for gender equality in the European Union in an audit carried out by the European Commission's Joint Research Centre. I'm also pleased to see that our index methodology has already been used by four EU candidate countries and potential candidates who have each developed their own national gender equality index. I'm looking forward to seeing more of these countries develop their own gender equality index in the future. This year, the thematic focus of the gender equality index is on digitalization, the future of work, and most importantly, the consequences for gender equality. The focus on digital technologies is very timely, especially in our current environment, where we have come to rely on them so much. Digital technologies and solutions have helped to make many things in our lives faster and easier. They're certainly helping a lot during this pandemic. To keep in touch with our loved ones, order groceries online, keep school lessons going, and con continue working from home, and to organize this conference today. But should we be worried about our increasingly digital lives? Our Gender Equality Index shows us that as our private, life, private and professional lives go increasingly digital, we must ensure that the gender perspective is not overlooked when it comes to important developments in this sector. 
the emergence of new types of jobs organized through online platforms, artificial intelligence algorithms and e-caring devices are all part of this digital transformation that have consequences for gender equality and need to be closely examined. I invite policymakers across Europe to use our index findings when planning future policy measures to design more inclusive societies that promote gender equality and best serve the different needs of women and men as we navigate our way out of this global pandemic. The future of Europe depends on it. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Karin. Karin Schiele, the director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. And our next speaker is Dimitrios Papadimoulis, a vice president of the European Parliament. Dimitrios. Uh, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to open this year's IEC Gender Equality Index 2020 conference. I'm happy to see so many participants able to join us today remotely. As the Vice President in charge of gender equality and the chair of the high level group on equality and diversity, it is of utmost interest to me to hear from IGE today about the EU gender equality scores and follow the discussions on the current status of gender topics within the EU what the areas for improvement are and what we as European legislators should be doing to help further move this agenda forward. The European Parliament is extremely grateful to the work done all these years by AIGE and praises particularly the Gender Equality Index as a, very, as a very important tool to measure progress of gender equality in the EU. IG findings and analysis are very useful for the European parliamentary work to, in order to shape suitable policies towards gender equality. As the Gender Equality Index demonstrates every year, the EU has a long way to go before reaching gender equality. Even more today, COVID-19 poses a serious threat to the fragile achievements made over the past decade. Jointly, we have to learn from the past to ensure that recovery measures post-COVID-19 leave no one behind. Let me focus my intervention on the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic towards gender equality and on the effects of digitalization towards gender equality. Together, we have to address the specific consequences of the COVID-19 crisis on women. The European Parliament has voiced grave concerns in relation to the reported rise in domestic violence across Europe, particularly during the lockdown, when victims have been effectively locked up with their abusers for weeks or months. Too many women and girls were abused in Europe. No one can, can ignore this arrow and we have to guarantee the safety and protection of women and children from violence. More alternative shelter or emergency accommodation are needed everywhere in Europe. As European Parliament, we had led by example by turning one of its buildings into a temporary center for particularly vulnerable women affected by the COVID-19 crisis. The European Parliament should also be at the forefront to combat new forms of gender-based violence linked to the rise of digitalization in society. Furthermore, the European Parliament will continue to strongly advocate for all EU member states to ratify the Council of Europe Conventions on Preventing and Combating Violence Against Women, the Istanbul Convention. The ratification of the Istanbul Convention is key for a better data collection, providing a more coherent legal framework and improving support and protection of victims. 
it is equally obvious that women are at the forefront of delivering essential services during the crisis. They have a large burden of care responsibilities for children, older persons, and persons with disabilities. In addition, a large number of healthcare workers are women. It is equally anticipated that the upcoming economic crisis will hit women harder than men and further deteriorate the increasing social and regional inequalities. Ensuring that all citizens have equal opportunities to succeed economically, socially, and politically, it is the heart of the European Parliament's work and must be at the center of Europe's recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. Let me stress that the equal pay for equal work between women and men must be a guiding principle when designing response measures to the COVID-19 crisis. This is why, as European Parliament, we welcome the Commission's commitment to present binding measures on pay transparency by the end of 2020 in order to effectively address gender pay and pension gap. Ladies and gentlemen, meanwhile COVID-19 is progressing, we have to address other current major challenges. Europe is as the crossroads of transitions, green, industrial, and digital. Europe must lead the transition to a healthy planet and a new digital world while leaving no one behind. The digital divide between rural and urban areas, but equally the gender digital divide is a cause of serious concern for the European Parliament. Therefore, we must promote education, education for girls, greater participation of women in STEM careers and representation in emerging economic fields that are important for sustainable development, including the ICT, digital and artificial intelligence sectors. Above all, the European Parliament believes that digitalization should pay attention to ethical and human-centric consideration in line with the core human rights values and democratic principles. New technologies can never mean new values. Respect for human dignity, pluralism, non-discrimination and protection of privacy must prevail in any technological advancement as they have shaped the European identity over the centuries. We must ensure that the European way is characterized by our human and ethical approach. We have to promote Europe's innovation capacity while ensuring that technology is developed without harm and bias. Studies have shown that women, people of color, LGBTQI and poor people are often disadvantaged by technological progress. The European Parliament will be particularly vigilant that any further regulation on artificial intelligence and other new technologies does not cement the inequalities. Finally, when it comes to gender balance within our institution, the European Parliament has already come a long way and wants to become a global leader in this field. Today, the representation of women in the European Parliament is 40% in the, and it is higher than the European average. The European Parliament Bureau is composed in a fully gender balanced way. These are certainly encouraging steps, but they are only a start at, and the European Parliament is endeavoring to achieve even better results in the future. We'd like to set an example for national governments across the Union as progress towards equality has stalled in many EU countries. This is why the Bureau has also approved unanimously my previous gender report, the Papadimoulis report, and also set new ambitious objectives for the end of that mandate for 2024. 50% heads of units, 50% directors, and 40% director general should be women. 
it equally adopted a gender action plan to ensure that the European Parliament, as a gender-sensitive parliament, provides equal access and participation for all genders and continues to progress towards this goal through political processes and procedures. It will be implemented by a roadmap containing tangible targets. Please be assured that the European Parliament is highly committed to put gender equality high on the political agenda of the EU. I wish you an interesting and productive conference, and I look forward to the discussion today. Thank you very much for your attention, and stay safe. Thank you very much, Dimitrios Papadimoulis, Vice President of the European Parliament. And now this is the moment you have all been waiting for. This is the moment we'll be revealing the results of this year's Gender Equality Index. You will learn about what is driving Europe forward and what is holding Europe back on gender equality. I welcome you to a video presentation by Yolanta Reingard and David Barbieri, respectively, Research and Statistics Program Coordinator and Statistics Officer, both at the European Institute for Gender Equality. Here we go. What is the Gender Equality Index? AGA's Gender Equality Index measures the progress of gender equality in the European Union. It shows gender equality trends in the domains of work, money, knowledge, time, power, health, and violence. The index also looks at intersecting inequalities, which considers the situation of different groups of women and men based on family type, level of education, country of birth, age, and disability. Each year, the Gender Equality Index scores the EU and the member states from 1 to 100. A score of 100 would mean that a country has reached full equality between women and men. Each year, the index has a thematic focus. This time, it links digitalization and the future of work with gender equality. This year, we found ourselves giving our annual gender equality update in the middle of a global pandemic. This crisis is having serious consequences for gender equality that are threatening to roll back some of the fragile achievements that have been made over the past decade. We hope that our index findings will help Europe's leaders to design solutions that will be inclusive and promote gender equality in our post-COVID-19 society. Now is the moment when we will reveal the updated index scores to see how the European Union and the member states are fearing when it comes to gender equality. The EU score in the Gender Equality Index 2020 is 67.9 out of 100. At this rate, the European Union is still at least 60 years away from gender equality upgrade. The top performing country in the gender equality in the European Union is Sweden, followed closely by Denmark and France. Sweden and Denmark keep their top spots since 2013 when the first Gender Equality Index was released. Sweden is the best performing country in five out of six domains, in the domains of work, knowledge, time, power, and health. Denmark is among the top performers in the domains of work, knowledge, and time sharing between women and men. France showed some outstanding performance in the domain of power and also ranks highly in the domain of money. The countries most in need of improvement are Greece, Hungary, and Romania. Greece and Romania need more substantial progress in closing gender gaps in decision-making, time spent on caring and social activities, and education. Hungary has the lowest representation of women in the European Union in their highest decision-making bodies, and the situation has worsened since 2010. The countries that have improved the most since 2010 are Italy, Luxembourg, and Malta. In Italy and Luxembourg, progress was mostly led by the improved gender balance in economic decision-making, 
following the introduction of binding legislation or other governmental action. Malta considerably narrowed gender gaps in participation in employment, key activities, and decision-making on research funding. The countries with the least improvements since 2010 are the Netherlands, Poland, Hungary, and Czechia. So what's driving gender equality forward in the European Union? It's the domain of power. Even though the use of our score is the lowest of all domains. The domain of power takes political, economic and social decision-making into account. The domain of power increased by almost 12 points since 2010 and by 1.6 points since the last year's edition. The improvement in the domain of power is responsible for about two-thirds of the total improvement of the Gender Equality Index score since 2010. Without these gains in power, gender equality in the EU would barely be progressing. The countries with the biggest gender balance in the highest decision-making posts are Sweden, France and Finland. France has improved the most in the EU, with a massive increase of 27.4 points since 2010, followed by Italy, Luxembourg and Germany. Economic decision-making accounts for the biggest improvement across the EU, jumping 17.9 points since 2010. This was largely due to the increased presence of women on the largest quoted company boards. The application of quotas or other soft measures by some member states has helped to address the gender imbalance. France is the only country to have over 40% of women on company boards and other eight countries have almost reached at least one-third of women on company boards, most of them by taking target actions. While these countries have been helping to drive progress, the rate of change will start to slow down and flatten out as they reach gender balance, so many other countries need to catch up because there are still a long way to go until gender balance is achieved especially in the top position. You know, men still account of 9 out of 10 CEOs in the largest quoted companies in the EU. Throughout the COVID-19 crisis, women have been largely missing from the decision-making bodies established to tackle the pandemic. While women represent the majority of healthcare workers, decisions have been taken mostly by men. While the domain of power is driving gender equality forward, there are serious challenges in the domain of knowledge. There has been very little progress over the last 10 years, just 1.8 since 2010 and 0.1 since last year's edition. One of the biggest problems holding back gender equality is segregation in education. This means a concentration of either girls or boys in certain subjects. Since 2010, Germany, Malta, the UK and the Netherlands have all gone backwards in this area, while Italy and Romania have made the biggest improvements. Despite efforts to tackle this issue, such as special initiatives to encourage girls to study science, engineering or ICT, Segregation has actually increased since 2010. If you look at students studying ICT at university in the EU, 82% are men. This pattern continues into the world of work, where 8 out of 10 ICT jobs in the EU are held by men. That's even more than in 2010. This situation means that women are not enjoying the full benefits of the ongoing digital transformation of the labor market. In fact, women are estimated to be at a slightly higher risk of being replaced in their jobs by robots compared to men. Jobs in the ICT sector are generally quite secure, well-paid and offer flexible working conditions. While women are largely missing from these jobs, there is a big dependence on women in the care sector, whose jobs are characterized by low pay 
and irregular working hours. The COVID-19 pandemic emphasized these gender inequalities, especially segregation in the labor market. Across the European Union, women make up 93% of child care workers and teachers' aides, 86% of personal care workers and health services, 95% of domestic cleaners and helpers. These professions are some of the most undervalued and underpaid jobs in the European Union. The domain of time in the Gender Equality Index shows us that women carry out the bulk of essential but unpaid care work in the home. With the COVID-19 pandemic, the lockdowns and closure of schools and workplaces put extra pressure on families, especially women and lone mothers, to combine childcare responsibilities and homeschooling while teleworking. On the positive side, fathers were spending more time at home looking after their children. Digital technologies can indeed help women and men to combine private life with paid work. However, telework arrangements are not a long-term solution to solve the shortage of adequate care services. New jobs offered by digital platforms are often perceived as flexible, but they are not necessarily challenging the unequal distribution of unpaid work. Under normal circumstances, the Gender Equality Index points out that insufficient or unaffordable care services push women to fill these gaps themselves, often keeping them out of full-time work or even keeping them out of work altogether. Due to care responsibilities, far more women than men work part-time. It is also the reason keeping some 7 0.7 million women out of the labor market compared to just 450,000 men. A lack of free time due to caring responsibilities make it harder for women also to find time for regular training to update their skills. As digital innovations are moving so fast, people need to keep on improving their skills if they want to take advantages of the new, well-paid jobs requiring a high level of digital skills. On average, 40% of women compared to 24% of men cannot participate in lifelong learning due to family responsibilities. In Cyprus, Malta, Greece, Austria and Spain, this is the case for more than 50% of women. So, what needs to change? We need work-life balance policies that not only aim to get more women into the labor market, but which also aim to get men to do more housework and caring for children, older and sick family members, and persons with disabilities. We need more recognition and improved working conditions in the care sector, which could encourage more people, and especially men, to choose a career in this important area. We need to challenge gender stereotypes early on in the school system to encourage young people to choose their subjects freely, regardless of gender. New opportunities in the labor market can benefit both women and men if more diverse career choices are offered to girls and boys, not just traditionally narrow career options. We need targeted measures to increase gender balance in decision-making we need to ensure women are included in decision-making processes and all emergency responses and COVID-19 recovery plans in consultation with women's civil society organizations. You can find all our index-related materials on EGE website. Compare the results of each country, view the report, explore the data, or play our index game. And we're back again. Now you, as it was said in the end of the video, can check the results of this year's index on Aegis website, eige.europe.eu. And there you can also see how your life looks like in Aegis index games. But welcome now to our high level panel. In this debate, we'll reflect on the results of the index and we'll take an in depth look at specifically decision-making 
and gender equality. The question here is, of course, how can we get more women at the decision-making table and why is that so important? But perhaps two words to set the scene first, one to the panelists and one to everybody else who's watching. To the panelists, look, my job is also to keep tra track of the timing and we are already slightly lagging behind. That is why I will almost inevitably interrupt you at occasions, either because of the timing or I want you just to change your point to make it more explicit. So that is just part of the game. And to the listeners, this is a reminder. If we have time at the end, there will be room for questions from the audience. So do use the chat at the right side of your screen where you can post the questions under Q&A. Okay, that's it for the rules. Now let me introduce the participants. We have Elena Dali, the Commissioner for Equality here in Brussels. Commissioner, a very warm welcome. Moving to Elena Bonetti, who is the Italian Minister for Equal Opportunities and Family. Benvenuta, Elena Bonetti. We also have Juliana Seifert, State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth in Germany. Herzlich willkommen, Juliana Seifert. And finally, we have Evelyn Regner, the Chair of the Women's Rights and Gender Equality Committee in the European Parliament. Ein ganz herzliches Willkommen auch Ihnen, Evelyn Regner. Well, I would like to kick off with a very quick round of personal assessments. We just have heard how far, or well, not really that far, we have come with gender equality in the European Union. Now, I would like to st start by asking each of you, what is your immediate personal reaction to these figures? Really short, in a few words. And I would like to go in reverse order, starting with you, Evelyn. Evelyn Regner, what's your personal take on those figures? A long way to go. That's it. Uh, care gap, pension gap, and the pay gap are really those challenges where we have to build bridges and this as soon as possible. And by the way, a statement I really would like to say, I'm wearing black today in solidarity with Polish women. Thank you very much, Evelyn. Juliana Seifert, your take, your personal reaction to those figures. Please, could you unmute your mic? We, we can't hear you. Juliana Seifert. Please, your, your mic seems to be muted. We still can't hear you. Juliana, Juliana, we, we still can't hear you. Your, your mic seems to be muted. So I, for the moment being, I switch to Elena Bonetti. What is your personal reaction to those figures, Elena? We made the significant progress on gender equality, not only in Italy, but uh, at the European level. And now it is uh, more important while we are facing the emergency again, and while at the same time we are planning the recovery after the COVID-19 pandemic, that gender equality policies are at the core of the EU and the member states' action, including through the use of the cohesion funds and the next generation EU. We need interventions on equality and empowerment of women and for the creation of the conditions to the, for the development of female talent. Let me say that we also need uh, to rely on quality of data and uh, in, in order to build appropriate policies. And I wish to thank uh, EIG for the great work done in this respect. Elena, thank you very much. <laughs> Going now to Helena Dali, the commissioner, your personal reaction to those figures, just in a few words. Listen, can you hear me? 
I can. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, my, my first impression is it leaves so much to be desired. We are speaking here about more than half the world's population. And, and there are still these huge gaps everywhere. So really, uh, we cannot do enough to, to address this. We must work harder and harder and harder. And Evelyn, I am wearing black too. Well, that is a very strong sign. We just try to switch back to Juliana Seifert for your immediate personal reaction. Hopefully we can hear you now. Well, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem to work. There is some there's something in the line. It, you're sure that your mic is not switched off? It's not muted. Okay, let's 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 nevertheless move into the debate. And I hope these microphone issues will be solved for Juliana because we of course want her to participate in the debate. Now, switching back to you, Commissioner, we just saw that. The European Union is 60 years, that is six full decades away from reaching complete gender equality and 60 years only if everything goes well, if there are no setbacks. But the COVID pandemic already now risks rolling back progress in gender equality. And that means that it could take even longer than expected. Now, Commissioner, what are some of the bold actions that the European Commission can take to ensure that gender equality strategy, which was launched earlier this year, really delivers on its objectives, and also to make sure that we don't go backwards. Commissioner. So much to say about this, but stop me when, when I've said too much. So the Commission okay. has presented an ambitious comprehensive strategy uh, for all citizens, all member states, all of Europe and beyond, I would say. So we have demonstrated a clear political commitment for gender equality, and we will now do all we can to realize the objectives of the strategy and use the pandemic as an opportunity. One of the most progressive actions seems to be the oldest one, equal mm. pay for equal work or work of equal value. Indeed, we need to do more and better over the next six years to reach the uh, gender equality. But we are not waiting and are currently working on a proposal, as I mentioned earlier, for binding measures on pay transparency and to make sure that full implementation of the equal pay principle happens sooner rather than later. The crucial point is the concept of equal value under evaluation of women's work is so ingrained in our society that some women might not even be aware that they are being underpaid. It is important to have more information and a better understanding of these issues in order to dispel any doubts around it. In 2017, still half of respondents to a Eurobarometer survey thought that at company level, female and, me and male employees are not paid the same for equivalent positions. So this must change. And this is why the Commission will table mandatory pay transparency measures by the end of the year. Of course, this initiative alone will not close the, the gender pay gap, and closing the gap requires a comprehensive approach addressing persistent gender stereotypes and women's work in lower paid uh, sectors. Uh, apart from this... Commissioner, I, I would like to interrupt you there because I, I would like to give it another try to switch to Juliana Seifert. Hopefully her mic issues have been solved now. Juliana Seifert, just, just test first. Can we hear you now? Can you say something? Still not, still not working. We can't hear you. Now, then I go further to Evelyn Regner, and I will try to jump into current affairs, but also human rights. As human gets ready to start deploying COVID-19 recovery measures across the continent, what would you say are the most important things to consider to ensure gender equality as well as respect for human rights? Evelyn Regner. 
with the COVID crisis, existing inequalities are sharpened, absolutely sharpened. So that's the one side, the sad side. And on the other side, what we see as well is the willingness and uh, really the strength of women, but also men supporting women in this fight are also getting stronger. And therefore, when we just look at the situation in Poland, as I mentioned it before, the basis of for every woman to fight for their financial, economic, societal, freedom, independence and well-being is, of course, the capability to decide on her own body. And we see right now women are willing to go on the streets men are willing to be real feminists to support them. We see the same thing in Belarus, to go out of Europe, that it is women being the real heroes and somehow pushing the strength uh, really to get their rights. And this is the basis for our progress, because I don't only want to speak about the, the bad things that are happening, we can achieve when we just look at those who are going on, where really there is progress. We see that's exactly there where then this strength of women, this willingness to put the topics on the agenda is really going on. I just marked the beautiful uh, progress we see in Malta, in Italy, in Luxembourg. That's not falling from sky. That's a fight. And that's also then the political decisions in those countries really to go for. And therefore, the, just the major things, binding measures, whatever it is. We need more visibility of women yeah, to bring them uh, to the podium, to make the figures seen, therefore the absolute importance of the gender equality index, and on the other side, to go for binding measures. And human rights are the basis, and female rights, uh, uh, women's rights are basic fundamental rights, are the basis for all achievements we are fighting right now for, for for the pay gap, for transparency measures, for uh, more uh, higher uh, a pay rise uh, at the minimum wages, especially in the in the care sector, for the attraction of men to go there. So the respect for those fundamental um, uh, women's rights is the basis for everything that follows. Evelyn, I take it from there back back just for a moment to the, to to the commissioner. And um, we just heard from Evelyn Regner what needs to be done to ensure both gender equality and respect for human rights in Europe. But how really can the Commission ensure that gender equality objectives, which are already embedded in the EU finding commitment, that these objectives really lead to gender equality outcomes in practice? Commissioner. Yes. Um to work systematically with gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting is key for progress on, on these gender equality uh, objectives. So these are powerful transformative strategies with the purpose to reallocate power and influence and, and resources in, in a fair and gender equal way. So a gender equality analysis and the budget processes is essential. Without money, there will be no gender equality. And women's economic empowerment, and we would not deliver on the objectives in this strategy. So to mainstream a gender perspective in the budget is also smart economics. It means more efficient policy and better use of resources by ensuring that policies are relevant for all women and men, girls and boys, in all their diversity, so they can live their lives to their full potential. As outlined in the gender equality strategy, a gender equal perspective will be integrated in the Commission's budget process, and this includes looking at the gender impact of activities and of how to measure expenditure related to gender equality at program level in the forthcoming multi-annual financial framework. So the 2021-2027 MFF will serve as a significant tool to promote gender equality in the coming period. And we want to, in to increase the contribution made by policy design and resource allocation to gender equality objectives. So the Commission is fully committed to integrating a gender perspective in all 
major commission initiatives during the mandate. And this must also be reflected in the MFF and the COVID crisis recovery packages uh, that we launch. And I would also like to thank Evelyn Regner here, here for her support in these endeavors. And I would like to call on the council not to neglect half of the population when considering the MFF and the RFF. Commissioner, thank you very much. And what we need, of course, is tangible change on the ground. Mr. Bonetti, Italy has won the award for the country that has most improved in gender equality over the past decade, an increase of almost 10 points. But the index also shows that in Italy, more than 80% of women spend at least one hour cooking and doing housework every day, while for men, the figure is only 20%. So despite legislation, such quotas for gender balance on boards that bring positive change, Elena Bonetti, what, what, what are the other, what, what, are, what, what could really be done to bring these changes into other areas of society? Elena Bonetti. The Italian experience of quotas is uh, definitely be positive with a strong increase in female leadership positions in Italy, in particular in the boards of directors of listed companies, where now women represent 37% uh, of members, thanks to the introduction of gender quotas uh, through the so-called uh, Golfo Mosca law. So the Italian experience leads me also to hope that the discussion on the Women on Board Directive uh, on the representation of women in the boards and company uh, listed the, also at the European level can resume in Europe as soon as possible. As uh, far as, uh, as you have said, uh, improve the distribution between men and women for paid uh, uh, work and unpaid uh, care work is concerned, this is a very important aspect of women's participation in the labour market and this subject was also under focus at the last EPSCO and this is an important issue not only in Italy but for the whole Europe and it has been timely managed by the German presidency. In my own opinion, as uh, the short and the medium term consequence of the pandemic show us, uh, women remain particularly resilient in managing work and family time. Nevertheless, it is essential also to encourage and, uh, encourage and achieve real co-responsibility between women and men within the social context to counter gender stereotypes that prevent women from achieving leadership responsibilities and position to overcome barriers to career advancement, especially in the fastest growing fields like STEM, IT, cloud computing, data, and artificial intelligence. Also supporting appropriate uh, initiatives for education and training in these fields and uh, on financial subjects and tools to activate new energy and opportunities for all, not just for women, but in particular for women. Coordinated action at uh, European level will also be essential in line with the gender equality strategy proposed by Elena Dalli. And we need that legal instruments are fully operational, such as those already adopted, let me say, for instance, the Work-Life Balance Directive, or under discussion, so to, bridge, so, to, so to bridge the gender gap in the labor market, such as measures to overcome, in particular, the gender pay gap. Moreover, European funds, from cohesion funds to the next generation EU, can also play an important role and uh, to support the measures, uh, including, uh, as is being debated in Italy, the promotion of stamps, and the dissemination of digital culture for a qualified inclusion of women in the labor market and for a sustainable development. Other important issues, I think, are the support for female entrepreneurship and measure for recruitment of women and mothers. 
in general Minister, intervention. Minister, Minister, in Minister, allow me to interrupt you a second. I, I would like to take this question back from the labor market to to the the household basically what what really needs to change that more men might be encouraged to share the load of housework because that is an important part of work and and of caring responsibilities too what, what can be done to achieve more gender equality in this domain too minister yes even today women are often faced with the choice to be mothers or to take care of the family and or to work. And let me say that uh, this is a misconception that a woman cannot be a good worker to be a mother or vice versa. So the labor market must have rules that allow women to be hired in their free choice of motherhood. We also need rules that enhance them with the career advancement. On the other side, we need to encourage uh, and to incentivize men to actively share family care with parental leaves, for example. As governments and as European Union, we must therefore provide tools that let women to be fully free to choose their professionalism and maternity and to rebalance the distribution between men and women for paid work and unpaid care work. This is the reason why the first reform adopted by the Italian government soon after the end of the lockdown was the Family Act that focuses on women's work and the reorganization of parental leaves. The Act is aimed at implementing tools to support parenting and social and educational role of families combating under natality in our country and uh, enhancing harmonious growth of girls, boys and young people to promote reconciliation of family work life, particularly for women. Minister, thank you very much. I just hear we have Juliane Seifert back. Juliane Seifert, I, I try it again with a, with a question to you. Hopefully this, this time it will work out. Juliane Seifert, across the continent, we are witnessing a growing polarization of opinions on gender equality. There are even some EU member states that are stepping back from certain gender equality commitments that they have signed up to earlier, like the Istanbul Convention. Well, my question would be really, what can the European EU presidency do to ensure that EU values on gender equality are upheld in the whole European Union? Juliane Seifert. Yeah, I hope you can hear me now. Hello from Berlin. Yes, we can. Yes, Excellent. we can. Yeah, that was a concrete, concrete example for existing obstacles in the field of gender equality and digitalization. I'm really sorry, but I... And I'm, I'm glad that we managed to solve it. Um, but uh, regarding to your, your question, um, you mentioned the Istanbul Convention and the concerning developments, especially in these days that we are witnessing in some European countries. The German presidency calls for a strong commitment for, of all European member states to make gender equality in Europe a real, reality for all. One step, one step towards more gender equality and eliminating violence against women and girls is, the, of course, the ratification of the Istanbul Convention by all Council of Europe members, member states and the European Union. And it would be a really important political signal to, for uniform standards of protection all over Europe. During our presidency, we will therefore continue to support the ratification of the Istanbul Convention by all member states of the Council of Europe and the European Union. I also would like to highlight that we are closely working together with Portugal and Slovenia in our trio presidency. And we are, of course, in close contact with several member states, supporters and non-support opponents of a European Union um, ratification. And we want, of course, are all together working to overcome the blockade of the opponents together with our partners. In July, we jointly signed our, signed our TRIO presidency declaration on gender equality. Maybe you have already seen it. It looks like this. 
and the declaration is the basis for our work during our presidency and um, the following, following presidencies during um, the trio. And I would like, um, 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 of course, the declaration is a reference point for us, other member states and the European Union's institutions. The declaration sets out our goals as we and we as the German presidency want to demonstrate that gender equality is one of the core values of the European Union. And this is why we have organized an informal meeting of the gender equality ministers. Actually, um, we planned that it should take place, of course, personally in Potsdam. That's close to, to Berlin on the 20th of November. Now we had to, um, yeah, we, we had, we will instead organize it virtually with a video conference on the 20th of November. And um, in, during the min ministers' meeting, we want to advocate a single Europe-wide telephone number on which all existing national violence against women helplines can be reached. And we want um, all European Union member states to commit to this initiative and, of course, to commit um, to the fight against vi violence against women. Thank you. Switching back to you, Commissioner. In, in the index, we have heard that improvements to gender equality in decision making are driving most of the progress in gender equality in the European Union, but only by a handful of countries. And at the same time, this is also the area with the greatest room for improvement. Now, I'd like to ask you, what can really be done to ensure that, that progress in this area continues both at EU level as well as in the member states? Thank you. Commissioner. Uh, it's, it's encouraging that gender equality in decision making uh, is improving. However, progress remains slow and varies, as you said, considerably between member states. We come from far, and with a score of 53.5 out of 100, there is still a long way to go to achieve gender parity in decision making. So the, fin the findings of the index confirm once again that binding measures are important to make progress happen rap more rapidly. The EU must speed up progress to deliver on the sustainable development goals on gender equality, and this requires political will and serious commitment of all decision makers. An inspiring example is that we have for the first time a woman president of the commission and a gender balanced college. I am happy to see also that our host country, Belgium, has now a gender balanced government. IGA figures on women in decision making show that 16 member states have put in place measures to achieve gender balance in decision making. Quotas have proven to be effective. Countries with quota legislation increased the share of women in decision making by 27.4 percentage points over 10 years. So during the same period, countries without any measures only increased by 2.9 percentage point. So the, the writing is on the wall. But I expect action by all uh, on the women on corporate boards proposal. Of course, the underrepresentation of women in decision making needs to be placed in the context of a number of policy efforts aimed at improving gender equality. So it includes policies to increase uh, the employment rate of women, to reduce the gender pay gap, to tackle gender segregation in education and employment, and to tackle the lack of transparency in uh, selection, nomination, and promotion processes. More needs to be done to promote family-friendly policies and to challenge the stereotypical assumptions about the roles and, and the abilities of women and men, as, as Elena was, was pointing out. So member states have to consider a broad range of measures, um, legislative and non-legislative, as well as the exchange of good practice to improving the gender balance in decision-making bodies in all areas. So I call on governments, political parties, social partners, the public and the private sector to establish far-reaching gender equality policies, set ambitious targets and timelines to implement effective measures to ensure the balanced representation of women and men in decision-making and leadership. 
Commissioner, re really, it is it is about bold actions, as we see again and again in in the answers. And as you say very rightly, and that could be another motto of this conference: the writing really is on the wall. Now, during the COVID nineteen pandemic, we've seen mostly women leading the health and care response on the ground, but we see mostly men dominating the talks on the exit strategy from the pandemic and from the crisis that has been induced by the pandemic. But at the same time, it seems to become clearer and clearer that countries that are led by women have done better in steering their societies through the crisis, at least so far. Evelyn Regner, let me turn to you again. How to ensure that women are at the table when COVID-19 recovery measures are discussed, and perhaps even more importantly, that their voices are really heard. Evelyn. So, what has to be done? Make women visible. Listen to them. That sounds quite simple. But i just give you uh, an example where we can see how, uh, how Europe is acting. I take uh, Juliane Seifert is here, the example of Germany. During the corona crisis in Germany, uh, two epidemiologists were uh, nominated, the big uh, uh, persons, the so important persons that are presenting the dates, data, the figures in the public, and whom you could see normally. It's always the man. I hardly see, uh, I just have to pick her name, Sandra Zizek. So, uh, and uh, uh, being confronted with that, um, she said uh, she often has to explain uh, other things as well. So what we need is make women who are in leading positions visible, listen to them. And this is also, of course, a, a task of media. We shouldn't underestimate the position and the possibilities of role models. So let's look at all those fantastic female leaders in Europe, but also all over the world, who are really doing better. And uh, with this, again, I would like to focus on what already Commissioner Dali uh, said, binding measures. I really am so grateful for uh, the Gender Equality Index and those fantastic data that ICA is presenting because they point the finger at those countries who did better and then we can analyze why are they doing better? Why France has excellent data? Why? Because here are binding measures for women leading companies and that they are efficient. Look at those countries at the short term who did better. As we mentioned before right now, Italy, Luxembourg, Malta. That's not falling from the sky. Gender equality is not falling from the sky. It is a result because of doing measures, because of political responsibility. And with those data we get right now from EIGE, we can draw our conclusions and can say, can say only binding measures, only quota, only European activity, only European rules with a mechanism that are really uh, 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 doing uh, an evaluation and looking what's happening, we can really improve the situation. And this is what is happening. And then also to point at the fingers what's happening in those countries having been mentioned, Netherlands, Poland, Hungary, Czechia, where the situation is worsening even, where there is almost no progress. Of course, there's also because of a non-existing political uh, responsibility. And therefore, we have to pick that out and demand this uh, uh, necessity to set also legal measures and to come back, just the other side, why there is women, women can lead when they make the problems, when they just, uh, um, I mean, women can lead, men uh, who are feminists as well, who put at, uh, the, the finger at the issue of diversity, inclusion, and then, of course, you're also acting better, have more success because of getting the whole picture. So. One conclusion is really, let's make women more visible, let's listen to them, and with this role model uh, situation, we can also fight better stereotypes and draw our conclusions from these uh, great databases, which is always the, the, the basis ground, what has to be done also uh, by all of us at European level in order to make the situation better. And finally, just one word, because uh, 
we are talking about all those fantastic data that have been revealed. I think we should also have a look on those data that are missing. When we are just looking on violence against women and where COVID really revealed a lot, we are still lacking data. And this is the basis on making the situation better. And uh, I think we should, uh, we should have a deeper insight on this as well. Evelyn, thank you. Thank you very much. Now, it becomes increasingly clear that it is visibility, but it is also that the invisible hand will not do it. Now, maybe to challenge a little bit that perspective, let me bring in our guest speaker from the private sector, which, as we have seen also in the index, is making the biggest gains in gender equality when it comes to gender, equality, uh, gender balance in decision making. Let me now give the floor to Ulrika Biesert, who is the Chief Human Resource Officer at the INCA Group, the group that owns IKEA, and which has committed to achieve gender balance in all leadership's role well, in two years. Now, Ulrika Biesert, how have these changes to achieve gender balance in all leadership roles influenced other HR policies or even triggered a sort of cultural shift in your organization? Ulrika. Thank you for this question, and um, it's an honor to be here in the company of Europe's most prominent equality leaders. And it's also a pleasure to be able to share IKEA's story with online participants of the event. Inca Group is a purpose-led company, and our purpose is to create a better everyday life for the many people. We believe strongly that equality is key to a better every day. Now start. Wait and then start. Ulrika? Should I, should I start from the beginning? I don't. Ulrika, we can't hear you. You can't hear me? Just, oh, now I can. Yes. Perfectly. Just go on. Okay, should I, uh, I start from the beginning then. So thank you for the question. It's an honor to be here in the company of Europe's most prominent equality leaders. It's also a pleasure to be able to share IKEA story with online participants of the event. Inca Group is a purpose-led company and our purpose is to create a better everyday life for the many people. And we believe strongly that equality is key to a better every day. Equality is not optional at IKEA. It's rooted in our vision and culture. It's consistent with our deep commitment to fairness and equal opportunities. And it helps us reflect and serve our diverse customer base. When we pledge to achieve gender balanced leadership, we didn't have all the answers on how we would achieve it, but we realized quickly that it required embedding equality into all our human resources practices. This included recruitment, succession, development, mobility, employment standards, and total rewards. We used interactive learning to educate the organization about unconscious gender bias, Bias that might slip into the decision around hiring, promotions and salary setting made by both women and men. And we asked our managers hiring for leadership roles to show what they have done to give women equal opportunity in the recruitment process. When we examined our succession planning, we realized that gender equality in decision making began at the level of the very first promotion of each coworker journey. And we took a deep dive into our setup for talent pipelines and we ensured that each manager understood their responsibility in contributing to gender balanced leadership. Gender balanced leadership cannot be reached by changing HR policies alone. Real movement requires a mind shift where equality is seen as an integrated part of our business agenda. At IKEA, 
We were able to break through when we required gender equality goals to be included in every business plan in the countries and personal commitment at the CEO and management board levels was critical in helping following through on our pledge. I'm proud to say that we treat our goals on equality with the same level of importance as we treat our financial goals. In terms of cultural change, I would say it's more a matter of making sure that we stay true to our culture and values. At IKEA, we pride ourselves into the inclusion, which is essential to creating true gender equality. Numbers are important, but what happens after? When female managers enter a traditionally male-dominated space, are their voice truly heard? Or are discussions still dominated by men, despite the numbers indicating balance? Gender equality can only thrive in a culture where everyone's unique perspective is valued and where different leadership styles, both masculine and feminine, are welcome. Today, 50% of all our managers are women. Our next step is to secure 50-50 gender balance in boards and committees by 2022. Our wish for lasting gender equality means we are working towards both horizontal and vertical balance. We focus on having more women in predominantly male roles as well as more men in predominantly female roles. Our gender equality journey continues to touch every part of our business. Gender equality will remain in focus for us when we are working towards our 20 and 22 goals. Beyond that, we see our contribution to a more gender equal world as a long term responsibility and something that doesn't have an end date. Thank you. Ulrika, thank you so much. And now I would have loved to engage a debate between you and the panelists However, I also promised that there will be a Q&A session at the end with questions from the audience. And unfortunately, it's either or. We don't have the time for both. So I go, I jump straight into the Q&A session with a few questions that came to my desk from the audience, which if you have typed in the Q&A section on the side of your screen. Now, one question I would like to uh, ask to Evelyn, because you mentioned Data, data, or earlier on already, how can improved data collection in the EU in order to better capture gender equalities with a strong intersectional focus help? Which are the key actors that can make a difference here? Evelyn. Uh, did you say intersectional? Did I properly understand you? With data collection with a strong intersectional focus. Could, yeah. could that help? I mean, uh, yes, of course, it could absolutely help. I mean, data is always the basis of every uh, uh, finding we have to, uh, to, to do political action. So if we don't know, if you can't prove it, then uh, we uh, have difficulties really to ask for action. And uh, it, the, the data uh, we, we got so far from, from EIGE were really of incredible help for all of the demands we know we have to do in order to fight the gender pay gap, the pension gap, to do something against violation. I mean, the whole agenda. So somehow it's absolutely important. And Helena Dali mentioned it before, referring to the, uh, to the budget that we need this gender mainstreaming in all areas. And when we do the gender mainstreaming in all areas, we can also uh, get a better, um, how should I say, a better way of knowing to do where we can do something in all those areas when also different sections, different uh, areas are more or less revealing data 
and uh, uh, how should I say, and, and, and really showing us then how we could do better. I still have the impression so many times that we are uh, we, that, that we are lacking of so many uh, so much information and with intersectional uh, data cooperation we really could do a lot in all fields fighting uh, uh, working on the, uh, on the on the violence issue of course where we where it really would make sense yeah not to, to look all, uh, only at the uh, at the data we get from uh, from from for example from 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 women's shelter and all authorities but also to know about more from the police which is always see there is a lot of bad things are happening simply because this cooperation doesn't exist and therefore the question is yes it is helpful and it uh, would be helped if already in the budget in the budget of the European Union this mainstreaming is reflected because then we just can also finance that Evelyn, thank you very much. Maybe a question uh, to the German presidency of the EU. And Julian Seifert, I take you as a representative of, of uh, the German EU presidency here, of course. How, how can we implement new solutions, both cultural and institutional, at EU level to make sure women's rights are guaranteed? For example, to pre prevent situations like the current one in Poland, which has already been alluded to today. Juliane Seifert. Yeah, I think we have to work on national level and European level on the same time. And um, one can see it, I, I can make it clear, the example of the Istanbul Convention I mentioned before. And um, we are, of course, working for that um, the member states on the one hand ratify the Istanbul Convention on national level, but even that the European Union is ratifying the um, Istanbul Convention on European level to make clear that we have um, certain rights and legal standards both on national and European level. And um, I think it's not, not possible to, to say that it, it has be either implemented on European or national level, but um, we have we have common values, we have common standards, and it is important to to agree on European level to have these standards to make progress on European level, but then to make it really concrete in everyday life of the people. Um, it has been also implemented on national level. Juliana, thank you so much. A question which is clearly for the European Commission, and that's why I direct this to Elena Dali. Could a revaluation of care work be linked with initiatives linked to the EU Green Deal? There are some studies that seem to be suggesting that care jobs are green jobs. Is there a concrete way to have gender at the core of the EU env environmental policies? Commissioner. Yes, we, we have uh, equality at the core of all policies. In fact, in fact the, the uh, Commission has a, a task force whereby we have a person in every portfolio. So whether it's the environment, whether it's the economy, whether it's health, policies and legislation are viewed from the equality perspective and thus even the gender equality perspective from the outset. So it's not an afterthought that, that we realize when, when uh, implementing a policy or a legislation, oh, we left the gender perspective out, you know, because it's mainstreamed at the very beginning. And the same is happening, is happening uh, happened actually with the with the uh, Green Deal and all the policies which are coming out of uh, the Green Deal. I, I think that that uh, uh, greening uh, should be everywhere in, uh, in the economy, in the inequality, in in ev everywhere because that is that is, if we want to really save this planet and we, if we really want to live healthy and happy lives it's 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 all about uh, the green the green deal so so yes care work and the green deal but but so many other areas as well commissioner thank you thank you so much now another question which probably requires a bit of a national perspective of, of an example that's why i asked this 
to the minister, Elena Bonetti. Now, could we make maternity leaves obligatory for the father as well? For example, obligatory three months leave after a new child is born. Just to, to the, the, the idea behind this being that it would just put men on a much more equal footing on the labor market. Elena Bonetti. Sorry. Let me start saying that uh, I'm really convinced that uh, only starting from women and with women, we can uh, build um, a new path for, um, of growth uh, for our countries. And um, without women, we cannot uh, build, project, and uh, think themselves into the future. So we need some uh, precise uh, actions, a uh, proposal for actions that I share with, uh, with you. First, uh, I think that we have to increase the number of women in uh, all uh, work uh, sectors. Then we have also to overcome barriers that prevent the advancement of career uh, for uh, women. And for instance, we need uh, to have some proper measures to uh, evaluate and uh, so then to introduce a gender impact assessment in business. We have uh, to uh, make more uh, efforts to introduce measures for the work-life balance and to support care, parenting and uh, also the unpaid care work in a new way of co-responsibility between men and women. We have also to pay attention for um, the freedom of women which now, who are now victims of violence and uh, integrated measures also for uh, uphold the female empowerment in new fields of, uh, of work. And uh, okay, let me say that we have a great opportunity now in our uh, countries and I think that uh, this opportunity is a favorable time to be seized now after the COVID-19 outbreak to reconstruct a new model of Europe in which the gender mainstreaming and the, 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 the challenge of the gender equality will be at the core of our efforts. Thank you very much, Minister. Hoping, of course, always that there will be such a clear cut after the pandemic. Well, unfortunately, we're already running out of time. Our session is already almost over. So I would, of course, like to continue this, this debate because there's still lots of questions we have received from the audience. And I think there are many, many open points to debate still. But I have to conclude because we're running out of time. So a very, very, very big thank you to all the panelists to attend today's debate. We've heard a few proposals on changes that are already been implemented, and which seem to be showing success. And we heard about a host of policy proposals that can be implemented on the level of European Union, as well as in the member states. And I think, we think there can't be any doubt this is a call for action, a call for action on something that should have been achieved a long time ago. Okay, and now we're going to have a short break of 15 minutes. And after that break, there will be the breakout sessions where experts will discuss some key questions related to digitalization and the different consequences on women, but also on men. The breakout session on platform work will explore whether work organized through online applications helps or hinders gender equality. And the other breakout session on the broader consequences of digitalization will look at both the positive and the negative impacts of our increasingly digital lives. And after those sessions, stay tuned. We also have two concluding speeches. So do make up your mind, enjoy the break, and I wish you all a most fruitful session. See you back at 11.45 sharp.
a very warm welcome back from the breakout sessions. I hope you enjoyed them. I hope there was food for thought for everyone. But more than all, I hope you took away motivation to really change things. Now, we're almost at the end of today's event, but very importantly, we still have two speeches to conclude, the first one of which is by Mariana Veira da Silva, Minister of State of the Presidency of Portugal. Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, dear ex-president ex Carlian Schill. It is with great pleasure that I join you here today. I am sure we would all prefer to be together physically. Unfortunately, uh, the current situation does not allow it, and it's up to us to go beyond uh, physical distance to achieve common political uh, common ground. Um, I can only thank uh, IG's president for all their efforts in uh, organizing uh, this event and, and as well for giving me the honor to deliver some closing remarks. Allow me to begin by assuming we all agree that pursuing fairness is a key foundation of European Union. That is why gender equality and ensuring both men and women are leveled when choosing their paths is of the utmost importance. Especially now that we see the social effects of the pandemic, we realize how important it is to ensure everyone, no matter the gender, makes the most of their potential. Since all these principles sustain the European pillar of social rights, its implementation is a priority. As the uh, incoming presidency of the Council of the European Union and member of the trio that signed a declaration on gender equality, I reaffirm our will of addressing inequalities in the labour market. For that reason, Portugal will be hosting a social summit next year. Today, I launch another edition of the Gender Equality Index. As minister in charge of this portfolio, I know how having a good data is fundamental to develop good, policy, pol good pu public policies and effective solutions. The work of IGS is a relevant contribution to well-informed policies. As the report states, at this pace in the European Union, it will, be, it will take 60 years to achieve gender equality. And though we've seen progress in some areas, we are yet to know the full extent of the COVID-19 crisis. This is true for the amount of unpaid care work performed by women in income distribution and generally in labour market. And the index that was presented today reinforces the importance of initiatives such as women on boards or binding pay transparency. Considering all this with the support of a research note from, uh, uh, from AIG, our presidency will focus on the impact of COVID-19 on gender equality in working conditions, in labor market situations and in work-life balance. Since 2010, the European Union generally score increased only 4.1 points. Of all domains measured, power fostered the most progress. But I would like to welcome this index thematic focus, since the digital revolution we are living brings about new inequalities. Although boys and girls seem to have similar levels of digital skills, girls tend to underestimate more their ability to work in ICT professions. As the index shows, as the index shows, progress is closing the pay gap as even very has been very limited. In fact, since 2010, it rose in most countries. Even though the situation is uh, cross-sectional, we can already anticipate which sectors will have better salaries. This is why policies aimed at deconstruction stereotypes now are crucial for the future. Today's professional choices will result, will result in tomorrow's gaps. 
I want to finish by uh, restating that Portugal is committed in its presidency to promote a necessary debate on these issues and to thank once more to a Ike for the continuous support to member states of the European Union in advancing uh, gender equality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mariana Veira da Silva, Minister of State of the Presidency of Portugal. And the honor of the concluding words goes, of course, to today's host, Karlin Schiele, the Director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. Karlin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olaf. Today we released a new edition of the Gender Equality Index. It shows clearly that gender equality achievements over the last decade are too slow and fragile and are today also threatened by the global pandemic. The Gender Equality Index will play a crucial role in assessing the impact of the pandemic and bringing evidence to policymakers over the years to come. Past editions of the index show us how member states policies following the global financial crisis affected the gender equality, mostly to the disadvantage of women. He must learn from the past to ensure that recovery measures post COVID-19 are designed in such a way that they eliminate inequalities between women and men, not deepen them. This year, our index has a special focus on the effects of digitalization on the world of work and the consequences for gender equality. We could not have imagined how very relevant this topic would become in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, which moved much of our lives online. Historically, women have provided a substantial contribution to technological innovation as programmers and computer scientists. Yet, the role of these women is often invisible and unrecognized. Today, in the 21st century, we are facing a striker gender, striking gender gap among scientists and engineers in high technology sectors. The untapped potential of talented women scientists alongside gender-blind research is preventing women from shaping the future to make sure it fits their needs. Digitalization is at the core of an ongoing, profound labor market transformation. It radically changes the content of existing jobs, leads to some jobs vanishing and others being created, and enables new flexible ways of working, such as platform work. This leads to a range of challenges and opportunities for gender equality in the domain of work. Today we heard that on the one hand, women's jobs are at a slightly higher risk of automation that many attractive jobs are emerging in fields dominated by men, such as ICT, and that well-established gender inequalities are resurfacing in platform work. On the other hand, increased work flexibility and changes in the structure of the labor market provide opportunities to improve women's participation in paid work, to challenge persistent gender segregation patterns, and perhaps even to spur a more equal dis distribution of unpaid work. We will need gender sensitive policies and regulations to unlock such opportunities. We will also need more research and gender statistics to make sure such measures are evidence based. Past innovations have rarely led to profound changes in gender equality when the design and implementation was gender blind. Rather, they often ended up reproducing old inequalities in a new setting. Societies in the EU are aging. We are in the middle of a global pandemic. Never has the importance of care, both paid and unpaid, been more clear. Technology-based solutions can support not only public health strategies, to contain the pandemic, but can also support the 41 million people in the EU providing informal care to their relatives and friends, most of them women. This caregiving role can become so intense and demanding that it is impossible for carers to maintain a professional career. This can put them at risk of social exclusion and poor health. 
From this perspective, assistive technologies are a promising development likely to support the quality of life of carers and care recipients alike. Although we can all think of examples where technology makes our life easier, it's also important to point to some of the developments that are alarming and can challenge the progress made on the gender equality front. First of all, we should be vigilant to the potential risks of artificial intelligence algorithms, which are embedded in almost every digital product and service we use. These include algorithmic gender bias and discrimination. A lack of diversity in the AI sector can also lead to algorithms embedding gender and racial stereotypes in the tools we rely on every day. Secondly, sexual harassment in the workplace is sadly a common experience for women in the EU. This form of gender-based violence is now increasingly enabled by digital technologies and is affecting women's work lives in dramatic ways. Women public figures, be they elected officials, activists, journalists, or you and are particularly targeted, especially on social media. This is often not related to what they are saying or posting or sharing, but clearly a strategy to silence them, undermine their authority, and send the message that women are not welcome in public spaces. We cannot let this go unaddressed. Considerable effort has been made to break barriers to women's participation in decision-making in all spheres of society. As you have heard earlier, the domain of power is showing important gains. Online violence against women can put it all at risk and deter women and girls from seeking leadership positions. In the future, I will continue to work in this area to bring the gender equality perspective forward in areas such as artificial intelligence, platform work, and cyber violence against women. As we are approaching the end of this conference, I want to express my biggest gratitude to all speakers, moderators, participants, and organizers of this conference. Special thanks go goes to the German Presidency of the Council of EU, the European Parliament, and the Commission as our partners in this event. Many thanks to all of you for being with us today and in the future. We are glad that even in these increasingly difficult circumstances, our Gender Equality Index attracted a huge audience today, committed to stand for gender equality. We hope you will find our work relevant in your daily work and lives. I also want to express my deepest appreciation for the expert advice received from the European Commission, in particular the Gender Equality Unit at DG Just and Eurostat, our main data provider. Also Eurofound, ILO, European Women's Lobby, Men Engage, Business Europe and experts from Germany who developed the third gender equality report, report of their country. We greatly benefited from your input. Last but not least, I also want to thank all my colleagues at AIGE, who have worked very hard to make sure we were able to share the results of the Gender Equality Index with you today. In spite of the special circumstances, we did an excellent job. Again, to all of you, thank you for being with us Stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Now, Karin Schiele, thank you very much, Karin Schiele, the director of the European Institute for Gender Equality. Now, I think the past hours have been an excellent opportunity to take stock of where we stand on gender equality and to reflect on the way ahead. And I think thank all participants and everybody who has been watching. The conclusion is most probably that this way is still a long way to go and that there is still a lot of work to do. One key sentence that was said in the debate earlier was gender equality is not going to fall from the blue sky. It requires cultural change and that implies everybody. And it requires political decisions and that, after all, implies everybody too.
But the one practical thing I really would like to recommend is to go to the website of the European Institute for Gender Equality, that is eige.europa.eu. There you can don download the whole index 2020 report, but there are also lots of fact sheets, animated sections, where you can dig much deeper than we could in this few hours now. In that sense, I wish you all a great day. Keep up the fight. Bye-bye.